Thank you, everyone, for being here for this session of the fMRI course. Um, before we get started, uh, we're going to be talking about functional connectivity today. How many of you have worked with functional connectivity data before? Okay, we're looking at maybe a quarter to a third of the people. Um, how many have heard of functional connectivity before today? Just about everyone. Javier definitely hasn't heard of it before. Yeah. Um, and uh, how many have a pretty good idea of what it is? OK. So that is slightly less than said they've worked with it before, which is a very interesting uh, split. We're going to work on that today. Um, and I know that this summer's course is a lot about controversies. But I still wanted to devote a lot of the front half of this lecture to be about the basics of fMRI, what it is, how it's measured, um, and a fair amount about what it's not, which has a lot to do with the controversies surrounding it. So let's get started. Here's a brief outline of what we're going to talk about. Um, as I mentioned, we'll talk about what it is, how it's related to structural connectivity, and how the two are measured, why we use FF, uh, functional connectivity, or FC, um, how we use it, how it might be used in the future. And finally, we'll start to talk about some controversies. And honestly, I'm going to go through the controversies pretty quickly. The idea of, of that half of the lecture is mostly to kind of throw at you all the things you need to think about when you're using functional connectivity data. And if you run into those problems, you can hopefully remember to go back to these slides maybe take a deeper look at some of the papers that I'm citing at the bottom. All right. So let's start by talking about uh, functional connectivity. A nice, concise definition that I like is functional connectivity is an undirected association between fMRI time series. So let's break this down. Actually, before we do, I want to give a quick definition here. Um, if we think of ROIs, or regions of interest, as nodes in the brain, these little circles that I'm plotting here, uh, functional connectivity is contained in the edges between those nodes. And the words nodes and edges are uh, from graph theory, which has been used um, in many domains beyond uh, fMRI. So that's why we're using them here. So again, let's break down this definition. Uh, this is undirected. That means if we're looking at the functional connectivity between region A and region B, we can't tell that region A is causing region B to get excited, and we can't tell that region B is getting, causing region A to get excited. Um, even if we do know that that's how neurons work, they have an input and an output, functional connectivity doesn't tell us that. It only tells us that A and B are associated to each with each other. It's an association between regions. So it's not a property of a single region. A region doesn't have functional connectivity. A pair of regions has functional connectivity. So we can't map it so easily onto a brain. Um, what we can do is map these sorts of edges, like you're seeing in the bottom here. And finally, this is based on fMRI time series, which by now, you're probably well acquainted, is not direct measurements of neural activity. Um, it's based on blood oxygenation in the brain, and um, that involves a lot of indirect effects. So we're not talking about a direct biological measure here. We're talking about um, uh, these, these associations based on fMRI time series. So you have to be measuring over time. And these three pieces of the definition make it different um, from other, um, uh, other methods. So if you're not happy about the undirected piece, maybe you'd like to use effective connectivity instead. If you're not happy about the association piece, maybe you'd like to use bold magnitude. And if you're not happy about this um, being based on fMRI time series and not um, a physical biological constant, maybe you'd like to use something like diffusion tensor imaging, which is a measure of structural connectivity. So um, I'm not going to talk about the first two, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the third, because um, it's widely perceived as the basis of um, functional connectivity. And we'll talk about the extent to which that's true. 
So first, let's talk about how these two are measured. And we'll start with structural connectivity, because I think it makes more intuitive sense. Um, you want to know if A and B are connected? Let's find the connections. Let's see where they are. And that's the promise of structural connectivity. The way that diffusion tensor imaging tries to measure structural connectivity is using the diffusion of water molecules. So if you have just a water molecule in a totally um, you know, constant space, uh, homogeneous space, it's going to diffuse randomly. It's no more likely to go left than right. But if you put that in um, a non-homogeneous space, like an axon in the brain, suddenly this water molecule is more likely to diffuse along the axon than it is perpendicular to it. Um, so now this, uh, this water molecule's diffusion has, uh, can be represented by a different tensor. A tensor is just a measure of the direction of that diffusion. So you can estimate that primary axis, that primary direction of the diffusion, and assign that voxel a corresponding color. So uh, if you look at, um, say, this area here, you can tell that uh, it might be hard to tell whether these um, molecules are going left to right or up and down, because it's surrounded by other um, bits of white matter. But uh, by looking at the color, you can tell that they're going mostly up and down. Uh, and, whoops, and based on these directions, you can also trace white matter tracts. So remember, white matter are the bundles of axons going between neurons. There are structural connect, um, connections. And we can trace them by very carefully going voxel to voxel and seeing which direction things tend to be going. So. We can trace it from this voxel going this direction to the next voxel over, who's also going in this direction to where it takes a right. We can trace it all the way from its beginning to its end. Um, and say, and people have gotten pretty good at this. It's, it's very challenging, but they can um, find white matter tracks that match up pretty well with things known tracks from histology. Um, functional connectivity, on the other hand, um, is correlation. One more thing to say about structural connectivity before we move on. Um, I don't think there is a structural con a DTI lecture this summer, um, but I encourage you to go back and look at Joel Saul's Sar um, lecture from 2017, which is on the website, if you're interested in learning more about this. Or just email Joel, because she's very helpful. Let's talk about functional connectivity. Um, remember, functional connectivity is correlation. So if we have these two time courses of region 1 and region 2, um, and here the color is just its time point, we can plot these, um, totally getting rid of their position in time, just as um, the activation in region 1 on one axis and the activation in region 2 on the other axis. And if we find a strong relationship, if we find that they're tightly clustered around a line, we can say that they have a strong correlation. And that strong correlation is a strong functional connectivity. Correlation and functional connectivity are the same thing in most cases. And uh, for those of you who haven't thought that very deeply about correlations in a while, I want to reiterate that it's not about the slope of the line. You could uh, double all the um, activations in region 2, and the correlation would stay exactly the same. This is about the percentage of variance that's explained in one region by the other. So if they're tightly clustered around a line, there's a perfect correlation. If they're not so tightly clustered, you get a lower correlation. And the same is true in the negative direction. The correlation goes negative, but it still has to be tightly clustered uh, for, for it to be strong. So that's one way that we typ typically look at uh, functional connectivity is between pairs of regions. Um, and often what we want to do with that is look across subjects. Uh, is Does one group have greater functional connectivity between a pair of nodes um, than another group does? And the way we might do this is by doing that analysis you saw on the last slide. We find correlations for each subject between region 1 and region 2. We give that correlation an R value. Let's see if I can find my pointer again. So each subject gets an R value. You typically um, transform that into a, a normally distributed Z value um, before averaging within groups and subtracting the average of the groups. It's important to do that Z transform because 
um, our values are bounded between 0 and 1. They're not normally distributed. And so um, if you average the r's, then uh, it typically won't um, average out in quite, quite the right way. If you um, transform them to have a normal distribution first, then the sum will also have a normal distribution. Before I move on, uh, does anyone have any questions about what, what we've talked about so far? Is any of this new to anyone? Has anyone never heard, heard this before? OK, I should move a little faster. OK. Uh, who, has worked, who is unfamiliar with seed-based analysis? OK, so very briefly, um, seed-based functional connectivity analysis is when you pick an ROI and you say, what is the connectivity of this ROI with all the other voxels in the brain? So we say, we know something weird is going on with the ACC. Let's put a seed there and see how its connectivity with all other voxels uh, changes based on a task or a group membership. And we can do that for multiple different ROIs, multiple different seeds, and see that different seeds have different voxels that they're uh, functionally um, correlated with. Now, um, when we're plotting functional connectivity, um, we're usually, uh, we're often um, looking at the function, what we call the functional connectome. So the uh, functional connectivity of each parcel or ROI with all the others. And that gives you something called a functional connectivity matrix that might look like this. So on each row and each column is just an ROI. Um, and uh, if you look at um, the first row and the second column, that's the functional correlation or the functional connect, uh, connectivity of region one with region two. Um, and you'll notice this is a symmetric matrix because this is an undirected association. Um, the FC between ROIs uh, of ROI with one with ROI two is the same as that of two ROI two with ROI one. I stumbled a little there, but I think you get the idea. Another way to look at this is to threshold this matrix and say only the um, edges that are um, you know, above a certain threshold, either statistically or, or magnitude, um, count. Um, and if we just plot those, we can look at it in a ring. Um, and here, the, uh, the dots along the edges are ROIs. Um, we put them all at once, uh, but they're colored according to their position in the brain. Um, and this lets you see all the connections at once and get an idea. Maybe frontal connections are not so important, um, but occipital and parietal ones are. Another way to look at this is with the brain template plot, um, where it, all the ROIs are plotted in their position on, in the brain, um, which makes it easier to see what's going on spatially, but more difficult to see everything at once because uh, some of the connections will block your view of the others. People try to get around that by plotting the same brain in multiple different orientations. If this is too much information, which it often is, you can summarize it um, by looking at a sort of region summary matrix. Um, you can either um, add up, take an average of the uh, connectivity within um, certain pairs of, of sort of macro scale regions. So all these ROIs are in the occipital lobe, or these ROIs are in the temporal lobe. So let's look at um, the connectivity between temporal and occipital regions. Okay, I'm guessing a lot of you have seen this before, so I'm going to move on. Um, anyone have any questions? Okay. So we've talked about these two. How different are they from each other? This is a, an important question because if they're exactly the same, there's no point in measuring both. Um, and if they're not, we want to know why not. So first thing to say is that uh, the resting state functional connectivity, uh, the connectivity you know, recorded while you're not doing anything in the scanner, um, is related to the structural connectivity. It's pretty strongly related. Um, if you're looking for effect size, this one paper gave a, a pretty um, precise measure. It says uh, the raw structural connectivity explains about a quarter of the variance of functional connectivity. We can tell this from the correlation coefficient. Um, since the r is about, point, about 0.5, 1 half, um, 
the uh, variance explained is um, R squared a quarter. But if we, t if we uh, take things that we know about resting state um, functional connectivity, say um, indirect connections, um, we can explain more about the resting state functional connectivity. So if A and B are structurally connected and B and C are structurally connected, um, then um, A might be functionally connected to both B and C because it has an indirect route to both of them. So if we use information like that um, to use uh, to make a, a nonlinear mapping from structural to functional connectivity, then we can get even closer to explaining functional connectivity from structural connectivity. Now we can explain about half of the variance. So that's that's like kind of nice in that um, it it says that this is based on real biological uh, connections, but it's also exciting that there's there are some differences. Um, for example, func uh, functional connectivity can be negative. You can have um, you know regions uh, where when one goes positive, the other tends to go negative. And that's something that um, DTI might not be able to tell us, even though we know that there are there is such a thing as inhibitory connections. Um, so this is one of the, the seminal papers on uh, resting state functional connectivity. And they show that uh, while the PCC and the um, medial prefrontal cortex tend to move together, these yellow and orange lines, the IPS in blue tends to move the opposite direction. So they say these are anticorrelated, and they identify these two sets of regions as the default mode network and the task positive network or the, um, the cognitive control network. So um, a controversy has, has come up surrounding this in that this anticorrelation might not be a real anticorrelation. It might be uh, caused by um, a choice they made in the preprocessing called global signal regression. Um, and we'll get to that later. Another uh, interesting and also controversial uh, difference between functional and structural connectivity is that functional connectivity can be dynamic. Um, if you take these, uh, these time courses and um, just look at a window early on in the time course and get the functional connectivity in that early window, it might look different than if you took the connectivity in a later window. Um, and people have gone so far as to try to pull out different functional connectivity states that tend to occur over and over during a resting state or a task run um, and to plot the prevalence of those states over time. Um, now, this is also controversial um, for reasons we'll get to later on. But I think it's really fun to watch, so I'd like to try and show you here. Um, yeah, so what we're looking at on the left is the um, windowed functional connectivity. And what we're looking at on the right is the state they've identified that most closely matches what you're currently observing. And this plot at the bottom is telling you which state you're in as sort of a line graph. So now we're in the constant state at three, so it's staying the same. But when we jump up to state four, you'll see a different functional connectivity state. So this is just another way that people are trying to understand this explosion of data that happens when you look at uh, things in a, from a functional connectivity standpoint instead of a magnitude standpoint. Yes, go ahead. Sure. Uh, the question is, what is a state? What does that mean in the context of functional connectivity time series? So a state is pretty, pr has pretty broad and fluid definitions. Here what we're talking about is um, whether they think that the actual functional connectivity is sort of uh, constant. It's like static in one state um, for a certain period of time, and then it changes to another state. Um, whether um, put, a, put it another way, whether you can sort of model, uh, whether you can explain what you're observing with a smaller number of discrete states rather than all the infinite possibilities that come with this giant functional connectivity matrix.
another way I can talk about states is um, that a lot of times people want to uh, use dy dynamic functional connectivity to say, like, you're in a, a good state um, to perceive a tone. So if you're in a good state, you might perceive a very soft tone. If you're in a bad state, you might miss it. Um, and so they want it. It's just a way of making this discrete, of making a cutoff between good and bad, or this type and another. Yeah, so is it more related to cognition or physiology? Um, people like to think it's uh, more related to cognition, and I think there's decent evidence that it is, but it's always a question with functional connectivity. How much of it is real neural activity, um, which we would think of as, as cognition, and how much is physiological, the, the sort of things that come with the hemodynamic response? Um, so it's complicated, um, and people just try to do the best they can to get rid of anything that's not neural activity um, so that they can say with some confidence that it's about cognition. So why do we use functional connectivity? The first reason is that it's there even at rest. Um, and this is great because you don't have to commit to a task. Um, you can just record people at rest and hopefully um, find out something interesting about the organization of the brain or the differences between individuals. In fact, this resting state activity is much bigger than the task activations that we've been studying for decades. Um, the uh, task activations tend to be about, explain about one to five percent of the bold signal we're observing. The rest is sort of there at rest. And so it's, it makes sense that we want to devote some time to understanding that. The functional connectivity is stable across scans. If you measure someone's uh, connectivity matrix two different times, they'll look pretty much the same. Um, and this is important because uh, it makes it a vi functional connectivity a sort of viable biomarker. Um, if you want to say this says something about their like um, unalterable traits, it has to be the same as long as that trait stays the same. And the other really interesting thing is that it varies across individuals and tasks. Um, and how many of you were here last week for Emily Finn's lecture? OK, about half. So uh, for, th for those of you that were there, this will be a repeat. Um, but I did want to spend some time on this anyway, because I think it's a really interesting paper. Um, they, uh, th this paper tries to break down um, how much of the functional connectivity matrix we're observing um, how much of the variability in that matrix is um, constant across individuals? How much is um, based on, is explainable by the individual's identity? And how much is explainable by the task they're doing? Uh, and how much is explainable by the session, whether they do the same thing multiple times? Um, and uh, to our delight, we find that a lot of, the, of this uh, is common across individuals, maybe 35 40%. And just about as much is explained by the differences between individuals. Um, 35 or 40% uh, tends to be explained by, uh, by the person's identity. And a smaller portion, maybe 20%, is explainable by the interaction between uh, individual and task. So note that it's not just an additive, um, you know, the individual's contribution plus the task contribution. It's sort of a, a more complicated interaction between the two. Um, and uh, the reason that's uh, exciting to me is that it raises the possibility that we can find biomarkers um, based on that strong inter-individual variability. Um, and that those biomarkers might be more or less likely to come out uh, if we have them doing different tasks, if we have them in different states. The other reason we might use functional connectivity is it gives us ac access to network analyses, um, just like structural connectivity might. Um, so uh, network, if you start to think about the brain as nodes and edges, as a network, then you're thinking about it largely the same way that people have thought about social networks or the internet. Um, these network analyses are well established. They've been used for, for a, v a very long time. And so we can apply those advances uh, very quickly to uh, 
understandings of the brain. Um, and that has gotten some people very excited. So if you read a paper with any of these terms on the right there, you're probably reading about graph theory, topology, modularity, order, small worldness, hubs, rich clubs, clustering coefficients, uh, path lengths, network and global efficiency. Um, all of these things were, were, uh, are being applied to, um, to the brain in the hopes that uh, they'll give us a new boost in understanding how the brain is operating. Um, that's at least one more lecture, if not a whole course, so I'm not going to really get into it here. But if you're interested in graph theory, I encourage you to take a look at some of these um, articles. Um, and if you ever get a chance to hear a, a talk by Danny Bassett, please do. She's a wonderful speaker. Um, functional connectivity uh, is predictive. This is another reason why we use it. And it sort of stems from these earlier um, uh, properties that I've talked about, the stability, the inter-individual variability. Because those things happen, we can use it to predict behavior and traits. Uh, this is one that I was talking about in response to an earlier question, where uh, they played a tone at threshold. Um, so you're just about as likely to hear it as not. And they found that um, if they looked at sort of uh, the magnitude of activity in auditory cortex, you weren't really any more or less likely to hear it based on the magnitude of activity there. What did explain whether or not you were able to hear the tone was the functional connectivity state that, was, that you were in uh, in the about 30 seconds beforehand. So there, this is uh, one of a number of cases where uh, functional connectivity has been able to pull out something that a normal magnitude kind of analysis hasn't. Any questions before we move on? OK. So we've talked about why we might use functional connectivity. Now let's talk about how we might use it. Um, and this, I think, is the, uh, the really exciting part. Um, we have the uh, newfound potential to use functional connectivity to predict traits and behavior. Um, this lets us shed new light on neural processes and on individual differences. Um, those individual differences might help us make brain-based diagnoses and predictions, uh, like who's going to uh, recover and who needs more help, um, who is going to respond to a treatment and who is not, um, things that can have real clinical impact. And finally, if we find out that uh, a disorder or problem is um, localized to a certain functional connectivity edge, maybe we can um, target an intervention towards that specific edge, um, the way that we might have in the past targeted a surgery towards a specific region. Um, and we can do this with drugs, with therapy, uh, with uh, brain stimulation or neurofeedback. So drugs or therapy, we might have to do some trial and error to figure out which drugs or, or therapies are affecting which edges. Brain stimulation and neurofeedback might be a more direct route where you can say, maybe we're just going to stimulate these two at the same time. Um, and with neurofeedback, of course, you can let the subject do the work and say, we're going to reward you if you modulate this edge that we think is important. And it's up to you to figure out how. Is anyone uh, totally unfamiliar with neurofeedback? OK, great. So uh, one way, the, one tricky thing about predicting traits and behavior from whole brain functional connectivity is that you've got a ton of different things that could be used for prediction. Um, you have this huge matrix that's probably full of thousands or tens of thousands of elements, and you're trying to predict one thing, uh, like uh, their diagnosis or their prognosis. So one way you might do that is with machine learning, uh, something like a support vector machine. Um, a simpler way that, that has uh, gained some traction is connectome-based predictive modeling, where you essentially consider each edge individually. And in a training set, you say, is this edge predictive? If so, um, I'll include it in my set. If not, I don't. And if we take all those predictive edges and sum up their connectivity, um, or take a, a, a weighted average, um, then that mean might be even more strongly uh, correlated with behavior, even in a training set that wasn't considered, or a testing set that wasn't considered when you chose your edges. Um, 
So th this uh, strategy has been used successfully in a study of sustained attention. Um, this is work where they gave people a very boring task to do, where a scene gradually changes to indoor and outdoor, um, and you're asked to, it's sort of a no go, no go task. You're asked to uh, press most of the time and then omit a press when an infrequent uh, target happens. Um, and people miss it a lot of the time because they're just zoning out. And uh, based on those, uh, on different individuals' performance in that task, we were able, uh, the, this um, paper was able to identify a set of edges um, in the connectivity matrix that strongly predicted whether someone was going to perform well or poorly on this task. You know, are they a good sustained attender or not? Um, and uh, you know, this correlation looks stronger than it really is because it's based on um, leave one out cross-validation. Um, but even in an independent sample, they found a pretty strong uh, correlation between the functional connectivity in this network they identified and um, ADHD symptoms. Um, in my postdoc, I used this same strategy uh, for something a little uh, more complex, uh, the ability of reading recall. So as people read a text in the scanner, um, we measured their brain activity and their functional connectivity. And we found that subjects with stronger connectivity in this particular set of edges uh, were more likely to answer comprehension questions correctly. Um, so uh, you know, this extends beyond uh, your sustained attentional state, um, although their sustained attention network was also predictive um, of, of reading recall. Uh, those of you who are here for Emily's talk will be familiar with this slide, uh, which lays out some of the other behaviors that have also been predicted from functional connectivity. We talked about sustained attention and ADHD symptoms and reading ability, but it's also been used to predict autism symptoms, uh, personality traits like neuroticism and extroversion, um, and even something fluffier like creativity. So this uh, opens up the possibility that uh, a lot about you is encoded in this, uh, these patterns of connectivity between regions. Um, and it's a, it's a growing area of research. What I think is really exciting is the possibility of using this clinically. So if you can predict whether or not a treatment is going to work, you can save somebody a lot of time and energy. Um, you can say, based on your scan, this, this is, treatment is not likely to work for you. Let's try something else. Um, and uh, a lot of times you'll get to the right alternative faster. Now, um, people are not quite ready to do that yet, but these sorts of results are promising. This is one for obsessive compulsive disorder where um, response to therapy was predicted by default mode and visual network connectivity. Uh, this has been used so many times uh, and to try to predict treatment response in um, depression that there's a whole um, uh, review paper on it, um, which I'm linking to here. And I won't go through this in detail. I just want to say that uh, different parts of connectivity have been used to predict response to antidepressants, uh, to TMS, or to, uh, to any treatment in general. So if we can start to stratify subjects, we might be able to break down, this is going to work for you, this is going to work for you, and we need something new that's going to work just for the other people. Um, it's also been used in schizophrenia, and sometimes these uh, networks are pretty complicated. Uh, here they had a pretty idea of the seeds they wanted to use, this one in the dorsal caudate, um, uh, and they found that the correlation with these two regions predicted um, the response to antipsychotics. Um, the ventral caudate also had one where stronger connectivity predicted better response, but also uh, the same region had other re um, ROIs where their connectivity with it um, was negatively associated with response to treatment. So it's not always more connectivity is better. Let's talk about the future. Um, given these promising results, what, what else might we be able to do with this? Um, 
And uh, I mentioned briefly uh, before that we might be able to target interventions um, like drugs therapy, brain stimulation, and neurofeedback to uh, directly get at some of these issues we're seeing in functional connectivity. Um, and two of these have been studied recently, so we're going to focus on them. Um, this attention network that we talked about earlier, um, the same scientists did a, an experiment where uh, methylphenidate or Ritalin uh, was given to some subjects, and they looked at the um, functional connectivity before and after. And they found that the differences in functional connectivity between people on the drug and not had a lot of similarity with the uh, high attention and low attention networks that they had identified from the sustained attention task. So Ritalin made you look more like a good attender. So it's sort of targeting the right functional connectivity edges to move one group towards another group's uh, functional connectivity state. A more direct way we might be able to, um, to deal with uh, functional connectivity is by using neurofeedback. So normally in neurofeedback, you target a region, you say, try to upmodulate this region, do whatever you can to make more activity in there. Functional connectivity is a little harder to do because it's correlations, and you usually need to look over a long period to figure out what the correlation is. Um, and so uh, Cal Ramoet um, at the NIH um, had a, a brilliant little uh, workaround for this where um, she just identified two regions that she wanted to be strongly correlate, more strongly correlated, and then a third sort of control region that she didn't care about. And whenever the two target regions went up together, but the control region went down, so it's not just a global effect because something's going in the other direction, then she said, that's a good correlation. We're going to reward that. Or if those two target regions went down and the control region went up, that's also good because it's a uh, strong correlation. So uh, in both of those cases, the, su the subject got a reward. And otherwise, they wouldn't get a reward. Um, and by doing this, uh, she was successfully able to train her, um, her subjects, who were autistic kids, um, to uh, modulate their functional connectivity. Um, and that modulation in functional connectivity showed some promise as actually translating into um, you know, uh, improvements in behavior on some, uh, some autism severity scales. So uh, it's not so pie in the sky anymore to imagine that we can um, modulate some of these functional connectivity aberrations that we might identify. Any questions before we move on? OK, we're getting near the end. Let's talk about controversies, because that's why we're here. This is all about controversies this summer. Um, and functional connectivity has plenty. The first one uh, that people tended to ask was, does resting state functional connectivity really originate from neural activity? Or is it just about the non-neural fluctuations in blood flow um, and blood pressure and all kinds of things um, that might contribute to the bold response? So um, you know, one of the things that has really encouraged people is uh, work by Elizabeth Hillman in rats, where they simultaneously measured uh, the neural activity with calcium imaging and um, the uh, hemodynamic activity. And they found that the two corresponded pretty well. So they see these resting state fluctuations in both, and they're pretty well uh, corresponding. So uh, what you're seeing on the left is the neural activity. What you're seeing here is the hemodynamic activity measured. This is uh, the model of hemodynamic activity um, based on the neural activity. And these two should match up pretty well. Uh, this is the difference between the model and the truly observed data. So you see a lot of, a lot of uh, correspondence between these two. And that was the thing that was exciting to functional connectivity researchers, because they can say there's some good evidence that this is real neural activity. The second um, controversy that comes up a lot is how long should someone scan? You know, the longer you scan, the more reliable your estimate of functional connectivity is. Um, 
but it's costly to, to keep scanning, and we, wanna, we don't want to scan for any longer than we have to. Uh, so Rasmus Byrne uh, and colleagues did a, a nice study where they tried to quantify like just how different will two scans be if they're really short or really long. Um, and you can see this sort of gradually leveling out of the benefits. Um, so you might find that uh, if you scan for 25 minutes, it's not that different than if you scan for 27 minutes. Um, and most people saw this kind of curve, and they picked somewhere in the like 10 to 15 minute range. Some people, I think, go as, as low as five, but I think most people will do resting scans for at least 10 minutes. What should the subject be doing? Um, this is something you also probably heard about from Emily. Um, rest may not be best if you want to study uh, intersubject differences. Um, one researcher who thought this, Tammy Vanderwall, um, tried three different kinds of scans. One just at rest, uh, one using an engaging movie, and one using an ambiguous movie that didn't really have a narrative. Uh, so those are rest, Inscapes, which is sort of a weird screensaver, uh, and Ocean's Eleven. Um, and it's a little tough to see here, but uh, essentially you're seeing a very strong subject identification rates um, in all three of these cases. And um, the engaging movie uh, seem to perform at least numerically best, if not statistically. So uh, an engaging movie might be just as good at picking out individual differences as rest is. And it might also have other advantages, like encouraging the subject to stay still. Um, on the other hand, rest scales really well. You don't have to get everyone to commit to the same movie. Um, you don't have to pick uh, a movie that may or may not affect the, the things you care about. You can just have people doing uh, rest. Um, another question is, you know, if you decide you want to look at the functional connectivity during task, what should you do with the known task correlated activity? Uh, should you regress that out before you're analyzing the, F's, the functional connectivity, or should you leave it in? This is uh, somewhat of an open question that largely depends on the exact question you're asking or uh, which one is going to help you with your prediction, which is sort of an empirical question. How should we pre-process? This is a really tricky one. Um, Functional connectivity is sensitive to choices that uh, affect the signal-to-noise ratio, uh, especially motion artifacts. Motion artifacts get a lot of play in functional connectivity debates. Um, if you have a big spike, then it's going to make, uh, that is across all the different ROIs, it's going to make everything look really connected, even though if you remove that spike, they might not look very connected at all. So uh, we want to get rid of, of motion artifacts as much as we can. Um, we also want to be sensitive to partial size. If you have an ROI that's really small, then its average activation might vary a lot more. You might get more uh, like large looking edges, strong looking edges than you would if you had fewer larger parcels. And that sort of thing is something you have to think about. Um, Similarly, if you have uh, parcels of the brain that are really near dropout locations up here maybe, um, then they might look like they have low functional connectivity with everything, and it's really just because they have low signal. Um, you want to be careful to remove things that are not neural, and one of the ways you can try to do that is by removing the mean signal in white matter and CSF voxels. That's a pretty common way to do things. Um, people also want to remove sort of scanner drift and um, other scanner artifacts. And so a lot of times what they'll do is, is bandpass filtering um, between about 0.01 and 0.1 hertz. Uh, and finally, there's global signal regression, um, which we talked about earlier. Um, this can be really effective in removing some of those global motion artifacts. And for that reason, some people are really strong proponents of global signal. Um, a lot of people at the NIH will advise you strongly against it, and that's because um, it can introduce anti-correlations. It can make two regions look like they're anti-correlated um, when, in fact, they're positively correlated. 
Um, in fact, global single regression mandates, it makes it uh, impossible not to get any anti-correlations, um, even though we know that in practice, uh, the whole brain does tend to move together a lot, and, and that's based on real neural activity, not on artifacts. So you have to think very carefully about um, you know, what's going to give you an unfair advantage and avoid doing that when you're uh, asking a specific question. And, and you have to um, consider global signal regression as a potential tool, but one that comes with risks. How should we select our ROIs? Um, we talked a little bit about parcel size. Um, we uh, earlier on talked about whether you want to use the whole functional connectome or whether you want to focus down on specific seeds and their correlations to other seeds or um, all the voxels in the brain. And then a lot of that depends on your specific question or your hypothesis. If you can narrow it down, that's great because an ROI by ROI matrix has a ton of um, you know, potential findings and you have to do multiple comparisons correction to make sure you're not just cherry picking the ones that look nice. When you're picking ROIs, uh, you have a choice whether to like have a, a sharp cutoff ROI, like this is the ROI right here, and right next to it is nothing, um, or whether to have a soft cutoff um, with something like independent components analysis, um, where you know a single voxel might have uh, non-zero contributions to more than one region or component. There are also ways you can uh, try to align across subjects. Um, spatial alignment is still the most common, um, but for certain questions, you might want to consider something like hyperalignment, where um, they have people, everybody watch the same video, and then they try to uh, align voxels that in two different subjects might be in the different place, might be in different places, but they both respond the same way to this video. Um, and uh, the downside is that takes you out of uh, normal 3D space and puts you in this sort of abstract uh, multi-dimensional space, but it can remove a lot of the inter-individual variability that's not really about um, variable responses, it's about variable anatomy. Uh, group ICA is uh, a more commonly used one, I think, um, that can also find subject level independent components that match across subjects. So different subjects might have different components, but uh, you can still match subject one's component A with subject two's component A. Then there's a question of how we should compute uh, functional connectivity. And um, I'm going to skip through this slide because we're almost out of time. Uh, but suffice to say that most people go with the simple Pearson correlation, simple and interpretable. But for certain questions, that might come with some risks that you don't want to take, and you might want to consider some of these other options. Another big controversy is how can we be sure that functional connectivity is dynamic? How do we know that, um, that it's not just a static thing that we're sampling, it looks dynamic? Um, and this is a warning bell set off by Martin Lindquist, among others. Uh, he said that something that's really static connectivity can look dynamic if you just pick short windows. You, by chance, get somewhere it looks high and somewhere it looks low, and it's going to change gradually because you're including a lot of the same time points as you smoothly move across the, the time series. So you want to be careful about not fooling yourself. Well, this looks neural. It looks real, uh, so it must be real. You have to be very careful about the statistics you use. You can also end up with sort of beat frequencies that look like dynamics but are really just about um, uh, differences in the frequencies involved in your window and your time series. So some possible solutions are just really careful statistics. Make sure you read a couple of these papers uh, to, to um, make sure you're doing things right. Or maybe using an alternative to sliding window, um, including uh, tapered windows, um, which you see over here. Uh, they don't have these sharp edges. They're sort of weighting uh, the ones near the edges only a little bit and weighting the ones near the middle more. Um, then there are model-based approaches like dynamic conditional correlation, which won't give you quite the level of, of detail. They'll, they'll 
more test a specific hypothesis or a specific property that you think is different. Um, and uh, the same is sort of true with hidden Markov models. They're sort of a way to model brain activity as a dynamic sequence of, of states that you might be in. Okay, we've made it to the end. Um, and I'm gonna uh, go right through and, and ask for questions afterwards um, because I, I want this to, to stay in your minds. Um, remember that functional connectivity is an undirected association between fMRI time series. It's a correlation. Um, it doesn't give you causality or direction or directness, um, no biological basis. Just be careful about what, that when you're interpreting your results. Functional connectivity is not structural connectivity, although structural connectivity can predict about 50% of the variance. Um, but functional connectivity is dynamic, and it can be negative. Uh, FC variability um, is largely due to inter-individual variability. About 40% of it is, inter is based on the individual, and about 20% is individual by task um, uh, interaction. And that makes it very appealing as a potential biomarker. Um, this variability can predict outcomes and suggest treatments. Um, people are using it in interesting ways. Um, but if you want to use this yourself, your acquisition and your pre-processing choices matter a lot. Um, you want to scan as long as you can. You want to be very careful about choosing global signal regression. Um, and uh, if you want to estimate dynamic functional connectivity, proceed with caution uh, to make sure that you don't fool yourself. So with that, um, I want to finish up. Thank Emily Finn uh, and Joelle Sarles for uh, providing some of the figures on these slides, uh, as well as Monica Rosenberg for her collaboration um, and uh, the section on functional imaging methods and the emotion and development branch, which is uh, the two places I've been spending my time uh, while doing some of the work um, presented in this, uh, uh, in this presentation. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and take any more questions. All right, I know that was fast. It was a lot, and I tried to cram it all in. Um, does anyone have any general questions about functional connectivity? Anything that confused you here? Is anyone using, using functional connectivity in their own research? Anyone want to share what they're using it for? Now's your chance. Sure. Doing, uh, the study is of amputees, and they're looking both before and after the amputation at resting state connectivity. So that's really cool. Um, would you mind grabbing the mic there so I can ask you a follow-up question? <laughs> so, so there, did you choose um, a single seed that you were looking at the functional connectivity for? So I'm probably not, this is a bad time to ask me. In, in terms of me, I'm currently collecting the data. So okay. most of the analysis I'm doing right now is non-resting state based. But uh, yeah. what would you suggest in terms of, I guess, how I'm proceeding? Well, I kind of want to open this up to the, the floor and see, see what people think. So if you were studying amputees uh, before and after the amputation, where might you expect the, the functional connectivity to change? Would you look at the whole brain? Would you maybe focus down on a specific region and its connections with others? What do you guys think? Yeah. What was that? So, yeah. Sensory she, motor. Sensory motor. So yeah. you've done that kind of stuff. I haven't done the actual analysis, but looking between the hemispheres at the two hand regions to mm -hmm. see if you kind of have a decrease in functional connectivity between the hand ROIs. Right. But. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. So there you have a, like a strong hypothesis of the two regions that are going to be involved, and you can just focus on those two. Um, but you might also look at like seed to whole brain. You might say like this region is about to lose its reason to be connected with everything else. So what's going to happen? Is it going to disconnect from everything? Is it going to uh, you know get reorganized and connect to something totally different, or is it going to stick around as if it's still there? Oh, are you going to get phantom limb stuff? How does that affect functional connectivity? I, that's a great, well, it's how you engage kind of the missing hand region, right? So it's having yeah. amputees move their phantom hand while inside the scanner. Cool. But I guess I do have a question for you. So sure. with a data set like this where, I mean, you, throughout your entire presentation, you talk about interceptric variability when it comes to resting state functional connectivity. Um, how difficult would you say it is to 
have a good kind of robust control group to compare individual subjects to to actually make probable claims about uh, these types of effects, right? Yeah. How easy do you feel like that is? Or maybe in other clinical data sets, do you feel like this is a problem? Do you feel like it's something we should maybe go away from? I mean, it's, it's difficult to do with our data set. But. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, people do try to control for things like age and gender and handedness um, because those are known to have big effects on, on brain activity and organization. Um, beyond that, people don't really control for a lot and uh, they try to compensate by having large data sets, as large as possible. You're gonna have a tricky one where uh, you're have, gonna have a very small number of, of amputees, but you have before and after and that's really the comparison you care about. Um, with some of the things I'm presenting here where it's uh, diagnosis uh, based or treatment based. I think a lot of them were like 20 to 30 subjects per, um, but where you're trying to get the dimensional things like uh, I talked about autism symptoms, creativity, ADHD, some of those were hundreds of subjects. So where possible, they try to get big data. Um, sometimes uh, this is, in some ways this is gonna get easier because um, human connectome project, biobank, these guys are collecting resting state data and you can use that to try to get a sort of baseline. But you have to be careful because uh, if you're recording on a different scanner, um, that can change your results. Um, so you can't just say, my, my patients look different than HCP, so this, this is real. Um, you, you have to also scan some um, uh, some controls yourself and demonstrate that they line up with the HCP subjects. Or you have to find both controls and um, patients within the HCP data set or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky thing. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Shoot. What are your thoughts on combining structural Oh, uh, Great question. So what, what are my thoughts on um, combining structural and functional connectivity? I wish I was more of an expert in this. I think it's an uh, emerging field and people are trying to figure out how to best do it. There's a really appealing reason to do it in that you can think of it as sort of hardware and software and the two should be working together. Um, but exactly how to do it I think is an open question. Um, I believe that Danny Bassett who at um, UPenn, who I men mentioned before, is doing some work in that area. Uh, there's probably a lot more that I'm, I'm not um, well aware of, but uh, yeah, it's, I think, an, an emerging area. Any other questions? All right, thank you all for coming. Have a good day.